Welcome to the European Union of Progressive Judaism's first podcast. It's hosted here in our Brussels office in the Betelel and International Jewish Center Synagogue. I'm Bill Etchickson, the director of the office. And we hope that this will be the first of many to come. Our goal is to invite guests from all over Europe uh, who have their interest to us in the European Union of Progressive Judaism. And if you have ideas for speakers, please do contact us. Our first guest is Katerina von Schnurbein. She's the European Commission Coordinator on Combating Anti-Semitism. She's the first ever European Commission Coordinator on anti Combating Anti-Semitism. Uh, she was appointed in December 2015. Katerina is a German citizen. She was born into a, raised in a Protestant family. She studied at University of Bonn and Charles University in Prague. She speaks German, English, Czech, Dutch, and French, and is now learning Hebrew, I hear. <laughs> she joined the European Commission in 2002. Before assuming her, her present post, Katerina worked for five years as an advisor to the European Union Commission President, Jose Manuel Barroso. She worked on the dialogue with religions. Um, the way we're going to do this, welcome Katerina. The Thank way you. we're going to do this is to uh, have me ask some questions, but you can type in your questions into the chat box and they will be relayed to me and asked to Katerina. So let's go in and start. Welcome Katerina. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bill. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here, here with the European uh, Union of uh, Progressive Judaism. I think, you know, also an honor to be the first uh, guest. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to thank you also for the close cooperation that we've had uh, over the past years. And um, it's mu much appreciated. Yes, yes, I know that we wanted to have you to our Geneva conference. And you said, I have to do something with the progressives. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad you did say that. Uh, and we're yes. glad to yeah. be able to do it, if not in person with everyone at the annual general meeting, at least here uh, we'll do virtually. It time. Yes, and we're in person, <laughs> which is good to, to, to be able to meet personally. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Why did you get interested in this uh, mission? Uh, you're not Jewish, uh, uh, maybe your German background, but tell mm. us what was your motivation for, for taking this up mm -hmm. and, and, and working to help Jews in Europe? Well, I actually think it's an advantage that I'm not Jewish um, because it gives me the liberty to um, raise my voice without being immediately mm. seen as being uh, partial or, uh, or raising only my own issues. Um, I think there are several reasons why I was uh, interested. Uh, one is certainly my, my background. Um, you said I'm Protestant. Uh, maybe one should add I'm Protestant. Uh, I was I grew up in a very Catholic area. So in a way, uh, there was this uh, notion of what it is to be in a diaspora, let's say, um, although it's a very different situation, of course. Um, and, uh, and also the, the, the way we were raised um, had to do with uh, the German past in some way. Um, I think my parents taught us that we have to take responsibility um, as Germans also in Europe is maybe even why I ended up in the EU. Um, but they also taught us empathy and um, you know, standing up for something. Um, and uh, we had contacts to Israel in the 80s. Uh, and it was, a, it was a very natural process. They also actively tried to uh, get in touch uh, at the time because we were a tiny uh, church and uh, con uh, contacted the synagogue that was closest to us uh, uh, mm -hmm. an hour away. And at the time, this was before 89, um, it was a, a synagogue only of a few Holocaust survivors. They didn't even have a minyan. And, uh, and we went there, our community, to see them. And I remember how I was small at the time. Uh, my, my parents and all the, all the uh, adults tried to keep the children quiet um, as we tend to be in church. In church yeah. <laughs> and, and they said, let them, you know, they were so happy to, to finally have this noise again in their, in their synagogue. So, um, yeah, I think all of these different um, aspects uh, had to do with the fact that it, it sort of came natural. And then, of course, I was the advisor to the president, as you said, for the dialogue with religions. And 
that also, in a way, was a natural step um, to, to do something mm -hmm. that was in one way related, but uh, definitely uh, uh, quite another dimension also. Mm. Mm. Has, has the EU become more interested in the fate of Europe's Jews recently? Does your uh, nomination show that? Was yes, I think, uh, I think it, it was both. It was, of course, the fact that we saw uh, a significant increase in, in anti-Semitism and also the attacks, uh, not least in 2015, uh, uh, the Hippakasher and then uh, and also the synagogue in Copenhagen. So, you know, this was one aspect, but I think there was also the realization that uh, as uh, society becomes more diverse, uh, we have to uh, step up our support uh, for uh, minorities and also, for example, make uh, Jewish life more visible. So um, w in this commission, um, to my title, um, coordinator on combating antisemitism, the, uh, it was added and fostering Jewish life in order to also express the fact that we want to uh, not only look at the, the negative aspects and fight, but also um, mm. support Jewish life here in Europe. Yeah. Well, let's start, though, with anti-Semitism. How do you analyze the problem? Is it rising? And uh, what is the mm. European Union doing about it? I believe definitely in the perception of the Jewish community, uh, it has been rising over the past uh, 15, 20 years. Um, it has become more visible in recent years, um, also because, uh, first of all, it's more outspoken. Um, we've seen uh, these uh, lethal attacks um, coming from within uh, the extremist Muslim uh, community. And now we also saw uh, the, uh, the attack from right-wing extremism in Halle. So, you know, this, this definitely is something that I think uh, was, came as a shock um, to, to many and uh, to some that had analyzed the situation for some time, not as a surprise. Um, I believe uh, that uh, we have also increased, improved uh, the recording of incidents. So we have a much better picture today mm. than we had even five years ago um, as to how the situation is uh, for the Jewish uh, community. So that, for example, um, incidents don't just start with a hate crime. You know, we have, we see daily um, harassment, but also simply to create an atmosphere in which Jews maybe don't feel comfortable to say that they are Jewish at the workplace because they don't want to have a comment about, you know, what is your prime minister doing and referring to Netanyahu. So this mm. kind of uh, atmosphere that has uh, also, uh, I believe, become more mm, visible. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this, this is the, the situation, and I think one important aspect for us when we started was to say we recognize all forms of anti-Semitism as equally pernicious, and we need to be able to define them to fight it. So one thing that we did was to um, uh, work with IRA actually at the time um, to pass the what is now called IRA definition on anti-Semitism mm -hmm. that was however there before um, and to uh, make it a non-legally binding instrument uh, for uh, law enforcement, uh, for uh, education, also for the media for example, um, to get an idea of what anti-Semitism is today. Mm. And that was I think uh, the, the first important step that happened um, actually only six months after I was um, appointed. And since then, we see how member states now s continue or start using it and continue to, to apply it in different uh, sectors. And that's really important because if you don't know what it is, you will never be able to uh, react vis-a-vis uh, -vis a, a victim in an appropriate manner. Mm. And uh, COVID, has COVID um, increased uh, anti-Semitism or spurred new theories and what are you doing about that? If so. I think uh, what we saw during COVID and, and very quickly was uh, that uh, incidents that would, could have taken place, let's say, uh, in the real world moved online. So we had the so-called Zoom bombing of, uh, you know, in April um, of Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, where suddenly 
um, commemorations that w had to be ta done online were disturbed. Um, and that was something I think that, you know, we were, we were looking, seeing how quickly within basically a month this, uh, this had happened. Um, mm. The other aspect is that we have seen the conspiracy myths about not only Jews being behind uh, the virus, but also in general uh, conspiracy against um, the Jewish community have increased, have become more outspoken, have uh, in particular from the right-wing extremism been fueled and reach probably further into the middle of society than this was the case before. We have, for example, started together with uh, UNESCO in Twitter a campaign now against uh, conspiracy myths, how to pre-bunk them, how to debunk them, how to recognize them, what to do when you recognize, how to talk to people who believe in them um, with a specific focus uh, on anti-Semitism. And this was one of the things that we did very um, spontaneously and quickly when we saw what was happening. Uh, we know, of course, you know, as we say in German, it's a drop on a hot stone. Um, but still, I think it's important for the big organizations to be seen as being able to react quickly and do something um, in, the, um, in the virtual uh, sphere. We have also been working since 2016 because the conspiracy theories probably have increased, but we have had hate speech for a very long time. Um, and uh, we created a code of conduct uh, with the platforms in 2016, whereby they agree to take down with in 24 hours illegal hate speech that mm -hmm. is flagged to them. And we have legislation in Europe um, that prohibits uh, hate speech uh, that when inciting. And what is illegal offline is illegal online, and therefore um, the platforms have to abide by the law. And uh, of course, this needs to go hand in hand, let's say, with um, the member states uh, taking the perpetrators to court, those who place the hate speech. Yeah? And we know how difficult this is because there are algorithms and um, and it's, uh, it's a lot of work. It, well, it yeah. also uh, the speed by which this hate speech is patch it okay. is, uh, is much quicker than uh, um, individuals could possibly uh, filter through and um, you know it not, not everything is black and white although if we manage to get the black stuff off I think we already can take um, quite a lot off so uh, this this was important to us we see that uh, there is an improvement in the sense that the platforms take much more responsibility today than they took five years ago as to acknowledging that they have a role to play to keep their platforms um, clean and safe. Um, we know we are not there yet. We, are w con we continue to work with them. There are new platforms, um, you know, where, for example, Holocaust denial and distortion has become a real issue. We have I've been in, uh, in touch with them uh, over the summer to see what can be done, you know, how to, to um, make sure that these things don't go viral. So we, we continue this work, but we think that the, the digital world is really very important. And we're trying here at the EUPJ, we've been working with uh, Arthur yes. Langerman to yeah. use his, um, uh, his database or his yeah. imagery to set up matching with Facebook and others. So we hope we, we would join you I think this is actually this. an excellent uh, example, example, you know, that, um, that propaganda that was used during Nazi time can serve today to recognize uh, um, things that need to be taken down. And then, of course, you still need to see whether things are put somewhere for research purposes or with a negative commentary. So it's not so easy. It's not only the recognition, but uh, the recognition already helps yes. a lot. Yeah. So I think we do have our first question from the audience, um, okay. which is from Very Leslie good. Bergman, because he contacted me before. And his question was, and we'll move a little bit away from anti-Semitism yes. to the positive. Are, are Jews good for the EU? <laughs> so we have always said um, since the beginning that uh, Europe wouldn't be Europe without Jews. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, 
I was um, maybe a personal story. I was now um, uh, in Salzburg at the festival of mm -hmm. uh, classical music, the, one of the biggest ones in, uh, in Europe, which took place under very um, strong, uh, strong restrictions, but it took place and it's uh, seen as a success also for the cultural world um, as, as you know, taking place despite Corona. Um, and why, uh, why was I invited to go is because it was the 100th festi uh, festival and it was uh, started by Jews. Um, and I think this, you know, the fact that in, the, uh, in 1920 this whole festival would not have been possible without the strong Jewish directors, uh, musicians, uh, conductors, you know, all of this, it just shows uh, one tiny aspect of the cultural heritage uh, that uh, Europe uh, carries uh, with its Jewish community. And I think our role is to make this, this also visible because only if you understand this richness before, you understand what the Shoah um, means. I mean, as to the extent that you can understand it, but. I think it opens another dimension of, of the Shoah as to what was actually uh, eradicated. Uh, and so um, definitely I believe that um, you know, uh, the Jews are good for Europe and uh, I think also the collaboration that we have all across uh, Europe shows that, um, that uh, the richness today and also the, the revival in some countries even of Jewish life um, is something that enriches Europe. Yes, I mean, and I know that we're working on, uh, you gave, well, we won a European Union grant yeah. called NOAA, Networks Against Anti-Semitism, Overcoming Anti-Semitism, but it is also about all the projects that we want our communities to do as outreach to show the Jewish contribution yeah. to Europe. So we've highlighted um, the revival of Judaism in Spain, uh, the historic association in Hamburg that is reviving. Actually, that's where liberal Judaism, reform, progressive Judaism started. Yeah. So all of those, and I would ask you as an audience uh, to send us examples of your, of your outreach where you're working in the larger community so that we can highlight it in our, in our, in our uh, outreach in this um, EU grant. So and that maybe one thing that is interesting also next year in Germany, um, Germany will celebrate 1,700 years of uh, Jewish life in Germany with a lot of different projects all across uh, Germany. And this is in the making, I believe, uh, also uh, for the prog uh, progressive um, community. This could be an opportunity to show the diversity also of uh, Jewish life. To show life. our roots oh. and, yeah. and, and uh, yeah, yeah. How, how actually progressive Judaism was born yes. in Europe, even if it's We should actually centered. look into this. Yes, <laughs> we should. Okay. Um, Let's go on to a little, some tougher questions, I guess, uh, which are about mm -hmm. um, uh, Jewish attitudes towards the EU. And um, I think many Jews criticize the EU for being anti-Israeli. Uh, is that true? Is there some justification there uh, and so forth? Um, I think that uh, Europe actually, if, uh, if we look at uh, the, the concrete situation uh, and the relationship between the EU in Israel, there's a lot of positive um, collaboration. Uh, Europe is Israel's first uh, trade partner. Uh, Israel is an important partner also for the uh, EU. Um, I, uh, I you took, took out a the figures, few uh, figures, figures, yes. yes. Uh, um, it has increased uh, over the past 15 years from 23 0.1 billion to 33.1, so that's an increase of 43%, which is actually enormous if you if you uh, think about it. Euro Europe and um, uh, Israel co collaborate on a lot of research. One billion of European money goes into uh, Israeli research in the next seven years to uh, to work on. Uh, joint uh, projects. We have the Open Sky Agreement since 2013, uh, I think, um, which has uh, increased, basically doubled um, uh, the, uh, the flights uh, and, uh, between Israel and uh, the EU. So there is actually a lot of positive things happening. Where, where we differ um, often is when it comes to the uh, conflict between Israel and Palestine. And if we look at it only through this lens, then uh, there are differences, but 
you know, I think it's, it's always like that. If you look at it only, in, if you look at problems only from one side, then you get a distorted uh, picture. So I believe that also for Europe, uh, security of Israel is, uh, is, has an absolute priority. Um, and uh, when it comes to BDS, for example, we have been very clear that we um, do not agree with isolating uh, Israel. So it's important to, to look at the nuances and look also at the whole spectrum and not only uh, through uh, one lens, because we know that often Europeans look at Israel through that lens, a high percentage actually, and get a distorted picture, but sometimes I have the uh, impression it's, always, uh, it's also the other way around. And not only Israelis look like uh, at Europe through that lens, but sometimes also uh, Jewish Europeans themselves actually look at the EU through that lens. And I think we have to be more uh, nuanced and open. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Were there other questions from the, from the participants' audience? Let's see. Uh, to which extent can the causes of anti-Semitism be multiplied, and what would you, what would that mean for preventing and fighting it? Uh, I assume that the question is about what we talked the about about the internet, or, yeah, or the causes. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think there indeed. I mean, we we see uh, different causes for anti-Semitism historically, um, and I think what is unfortunate with anti-Semitism is that it has developed over the centuries and never dropped a single reason but always added on. Uh, mm. um, we, we still have the age-old Christian um, anti-Semitism, although it's, it's probably not so out outspoken anymore. It's not official anymore, mm. but uh, it still exists. We, we have the, the racist aspects uh, to it. We see the conspiracy myths that were created among other, through the elders of Zion, but not only. Um, we, we have left-wing anti-Semitism and we have uh, Islamist uh, anti-Semitism that often, by the way, combines, I think, uh, the, the traditional racist uh, ideas with, and we have added on after the Holocaust where you could have thought that anti-Semitism ceases, Holocaust denial as another form, and once Israel was created, now we have Israel-related anti-Semitism. So I think these, uh, the whole uh, spectrum, unfortunately, um, uh, is uh, is still here, and and the causes are multiple, uh, from the scapegoats to the to the conspiracy myths, um, you know, of. Um, Jews having too much power and being too rich and all, all the other um, ideas um, that we have seen again now with COVID that just came up in different forms mm -hmm. again, you know. Um, and I think it's important, as I said before, to recognize all of these forms and to say we, we need to uh, tackle all of them. And, it, and it's, it's not easy. Um, and also I think there are differences between the member states it's important to see also between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, there are significant differences in, in how anti-Semitism is expressed. Um, uh, but yes. unfortunately, the, the causes are, yeah, there are a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, we, we talked about the differences in Europe with Eastern Europe and the liberal democracies mm -hmm. that we're seeing in Hungary and Poland. <coughs> how does that play into your uh, analysis of anti-Semitism in Europe? Well, mm -hmm. and we know from also from our surveys uh, that uh, the anti-Semitism we see in, in Central and Eastern Europe is more related to the traditional forms. Um, it, there is uh, fewer uh, Israel-related anti-Semitism, but I think the idea of, of otherness uh, is probably more prevalent. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's like the the uh, area where I come from in uh, in southeastern Bavaria, which was very homogeneous, and um, uh, and somebody other, even somebody Protestant, was already seen as, <laughs> as, as strange. Yeah. So, um, and I think this is the case in in many of uh, of the countries where um, after the Second World War, um, uh, where where the Jewish population had been uh, uh, exterminated or 
Left well, I think it also has a lot to do with their own history and the rewriting of. Uh, and of then, uh, yes. yeah, this this comes this comes uh, today. I mean, you know, they were victims on the one side. Um, they were attacked by Germany. On the other side, they uh, they uh, of course also collaborated. So you have these two things, and it's very difficult to look uh, in this um, unmask view into your own uh, history. So I think it indeed has a lot of uh, different... And I think we have a question that is, uh, you know, how, uh, how, what can the EU do to ensure the decent education or, uh, of, of history and yeah. Jewish history? Yes, um, I, it's, it is indeed a challenge because um, uh, education is purely a member state issue. They can write their curricula, they can train their teachers, they, all of this is co totally in their hands. However, um, we know also before the background that I just said that you know, there, there is a need to look into your past in order to have uh, an open future. And so what we have done um, actually as part of a declaration that the member states passed 2018 mm -hmm. by unanimity um, against anti-Semitism, uh, education plays a role and it gives us a possibility to uh, discuss with the member states how they want to, um, uh, well, look into their curricula when it comes to Jewish mm -hmm. history, uh, Jewish life, um, uh, the Holocaust, but also anti-Semitism today, how they uh, cover it. And we actually had um, the first meeting uh, on this specific subject in December last year. And we bring together representatives from the Ministry of Education with the respective Jewish community from each country um, for them to not only listen to the panel, which of course is one important aspect where we bring experts and we show also what is already available because there is a lot out there. Mm -hmm. um, but we also want them to discuss then, uh, as we call it, uh, discussion among six eyes. So two from member states and one representative from the Jewish community among themselves as to what could be done. And there are a few countries, one of them, for example, uh, is Hungary, where they have created a consortium of uh, Jewish organizations to work with the Ministry of Education uh, and look into the curricula of secondary and primary school as to how Jews are portrayed. So this is, of course, the, uh, uh, an ideal scenario, and you maybe wouldn't expect it, um, mm -hmm. but it is definitely, I would say, a best practice yeah, to and do it like that. How can our communities contribute or work with you uh, on this and other issues? Um, well, I mean, the, the, we as uh, EU don't produce the um, material. We rely on uh, organizations like, for example, um, the uh, Fundamental Rights uh, Agency that has worked on this, but also uh, the OSCE, uh, UNESCO, uh, and then of course a lot of private uh, organizations, but also Yad Vashem. Um, a lot of, I mean, we have set up a whole platform, European Holocaust Rem remembrance infrastructure where they collaborate among uh, each other, um, including the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and Yad Vashem and then the different uh, research centers here to, to produce material from archives, but also um, you know, new innovative ways of how you teach and also um, how we uh, can remember because this will, of course, I mean, this is, I think, uh, one of the elephants in the room. How, um, how will we remember the Holocaust in the next 25 years? And, and, you know, all of these are aspects that we discuss with member states and we want to encourage them. We support them through projects. Uh, we give them best practices. We en ensure the exchange between member states and the communities. So all of you out there, you should contact us if you want to get involved in these projects, yes. for example, the Hungarian project. Yes. It's important that liberal Jews, progressive Jews, yeah. also be present, and I think it's possible now. So a rabbi, I don't know which rabbi, wants to participate in the Dutch documentary about Jews. Is it safe for him uh, to give his name and address in, in the documentary? 
Um, I wouldn't give my address in a documentary, I tell you honestly. <laughs> and we're not giving <laughs> your address in this. Uh, you've got, no, well, we're no, but, um, you know, actually, I think um, we, we all have to be prudent. And it is true that, um, that the, you know, the security of the Jewish communities in some countries is, uh, is not, um, not a given. And this, I mean, this is uh, the other thing that we have uh, been addressing and actually this declaration mm. that I mentioned started from the point of ensuring security for Jewish communities um, and we n we need to make sure that um, uh, not only I mean that that Jews feel safe and that they see their future in Europe only they will see their future in Europe only if they feel safe and so this is really one of the important points we've been addressing this uh, with member states repeatedly, including in this working group where we bring together then ministries of interior with the Jewish communities and um, make sure that they discuss from joint risk analysis to um, who is financing this. We think that it should be the state that ensures the security of the citizens and therefore uh, also has to pay for the necessary um, uh, training and also the physical um, you know, cameras and all of that. Um, and we have also now launched uh, a call for proposal where either different communities can collaborate together to request funding for security um, systems or, um, well, setting up uh, security standards or member states together with uh, communities can do this and it's called uh, security for places of worship, which is, extends to larger, um, you know, also premises like schools and so on. Um, and uh, that is also an expression of how we think that in ensuring the security of uh, minorities is simply really important. Yeah. Yeah. And we hope to be able to apply. We're planning, <laughs> I'll explain <laughs> our project later. Yeah. Everyone on the, on the podcast should, should know about <laughs> it because we've been talking about yes. this a lot. So uh, is a good question from the UK. The UK has been a supporter of Jewish rights. How will Brexit impact <laughs> EU policies on well. anti-Semitism and Jewish Culture. What can, I can say that we miss the Jewish community just as much as we miss also the representatives uh, from uh, the government in our working group because uh, uh, the, uh, the UK has for a long time actually uh, developed a lot of good cooperation. For example, the police with the CST, the uh, Community Security Trust, um, the funding, the Holocaust uh, Memorial Trust that exists, you know, this, this, is some, this is a dream of mine to establish something like this for Europe. Um, so definitely um, we miss them. <laughs> we do too, but they're still part of the European Union. What are the political changes in the, uh, to the EU in identifying itself with the fight in, against anti-Semitism? I think you answered a little of that, but again, and does the risk of alienating member states with powerful uh, right-wing populism um, restrain you, I guess, is the, is the question. So it would be the Hungary, Poland, yeah. and, and, and far-right uh, or, okay. or right-wing populism. Yeah, okay. um, actually, I think uh, when it comes to the political uh, scene, um, it, it's, uh, it's a challenge because it's so multifaceted. Um, as I said, um, the, this project on education, for example, was in Hungary and in, in under the Orban government. And at the same time, we see a Soros campaign that is clearly anti-Semitic. So, um, you know, this, this is, the, this is the, the, the challenge. Is, oh, there's also the challenge of right-wing populists being, for example, against um, circumcision or against kosher slaughtering um, or halal slaughtering also. Um, and at the same time, um, being very pro-Israel and um, showing themselves as the best friends of Israel. So they, they 
they neglect the Jewish community here while they think that um, you know, Israel treats the Muslims so badly so we have actually a common friend and a common enemy. And uh, this, this is a complicated uh, setting uh, and I think that um, you know, we, ha we have to be um, careful to really address the issue, to look into how, what effect do our policies have on the Jewish community here. And that's important for all politicians, I believe. Mm. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about, in finishing, about progressive Judaism. Uh, one of our problems is, is that we aren't always recognized as a legitimate form of, of, of Judaism, in, and most of the money and, and recognition goes to the traditional Orthodox communities. Is there anything the EU can do about that to help us? You mean on national level, the, the money goes to? Yes. Yeah, yeah. well, the structural uh, support, yes. I, I assume. Well, I know. Um, I'm not going to get into intra-Jewish uh, <laughs> issues. Mm -hmm. It's too complicated for me. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, of course, um, I think with the diversity um, that is increasing, it's also important to, to increase the, the recognition within the minorities. Huh? Um, I think that, uh, that Judaism traditionally has been rather well organized vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the state, which in a way is also your problem, <laughs> you know. Yes. So um, while because of, the, uh, because of the elected interface, I think really it is something that needs to be sorted out within uh, the, the Jewish uh, communities to ensure that, for example, on the central boards um, that are elected, you have also the, the smaller communities uh, represented. And I know that's not easy, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, for us as, a, as the European Commission, and also before when I was uh, um, responsible for the dialogue with religions, it was always important to uh, look at not only at representativity as a factor. It is one factor also when it comes to, for example, uh, the Christian representativity you know, coming from the Catholic and the Protestant uh, side, but you have also a lot of smaller churches that have the right to be in uh, dialogue uh, with the institutions. So I think this it is important um, to to recognize this, but um, we, and for us also, as, as you know, and I mean, we are already uh, funding one project, uh, it's, not an, it's not at all an issue. Um, we look at the projects and the quality of the projects, um, uh, but it's, uh, it's not possible, let's say, to you know, change the situation in the member states for the EU as such. Yes, but I, I think uh, our goal is to show that there is a, a pluralistic, uh, gender-neutral, uh, modern Judaism yeah. uh, here in Brussels, and I hope uh, we can continue working with you. I think we, uh, we're we about running out of time. If you, there's any last questions, please send them, because we're going to go on to the... Uh, we have five more minutes. Okay. <laughs> so I should keep on talking. Uh, are there other things that... Uh, I know that when we talked that you wanted to say about your initiatives and the, and the projects that you're leading and your priorities for the next five years. Yes, yeah, so um, I believe that the, the past five years it was very important to build up trust with the Jewish communities, to establish a dialogue really, um, to listen also, um, and to feed that into the policy making and into the, um, I mean, uh, to advise the political level, let's say, on where, where we are heading, um, to work also on uh, common basis with the member states as we did with the declaration but also in the European Parliament the resolution was passed in 2017 and to establish this uh, definition um, uh, the IRA definition um, I believe for the next five years the big challenge will be that um, and I, I speak in five years because the Commission is elected yeah. uh, in that uh, sense but I think that under the, the von der Leyen uh, Commission it will be important to ensure that um, the efforts that we do on European level actually trickle down because um, we can decide whatever we want here um, unless it goes to the regional and the local and the level of mayors and the schools and the police, uh, nothing will change for the Jewish community. Um, and I believe 
to reach out to the general public and to make sure that in local administration and the local authorities um, we see a change of thinking um, that will be uh, the challenge and um, and it and five years won't be enough huh, to to uh, accomplish this but i, I believe uh, we we need to work through the structures that we have with the member states but also we have the committee of the region for example we have um, uh, a gathering of mayors uh, from big cities you know to to ensure that um, that really the awareness about um, uh, the often small jewish community and their their daily struggle uh, increases. And then I think it has to be clear that the state is on the side of the victim when an incident happens. And that uh, someone, I mean, we know that there is a very high figure, for example, of underreporting of incidents because people think that nothing changes when you go to the police or they don't want to have to explain uh, why this was actually anti-Semitic. Yeah. And the same we see in schools when there is a conflict between a Jewish child and a Muslim child that um, the teachers think they have to uh, solve the Middle East conflict uh, rather than to clearly um, address yes. uh, the issue yes. and you know as they would let's say in other circumstances where one is hit by uh, by another child yeah. so I think this th this will be the um, the big challenge and for that we will have to make sure that um, that we use really the, the structure, the so-called mainstream, um, the fight against anti-Semitism and also the preventive um, measures and ensure that we use our funds uh, on research. We use the funds that we have for you know, the, the wider educational um, instruments, um, also the structures that, uh, that exist, for example, with the youth in sports. Um, uh, that we make sure that in training uh, for uh, police uh, the IRA definition plays a role in explaining how anti-Semitism can express itself. Yeah. And it has nothing to do, as is often uh, said, with uh, trying to hamper criticism of Israel. The, the, the document very clearly says that uh, expressions towards um, Israel, like that towards any other country, cannot be considered anti-Semitic. So it's, you know, it's when anti-Semitism hides behind anti-Zionism that things uh, become uh, anti-Semitic and therefore also need to be named as such. So all these kind of things need to be um, uh, addressed and I think there is a lot of um, uh, work ahead. Thankfully, uh, the, the president uh, okay. also uh, uh, increased the team so she clearly um, wants to uh, move ahead and she has made this a priority also by giving the portfolio on the political level to Vice President Skinas who um, is very dedicated and uh, you know uh, wants to see concrete uh, action and concrete steps forward. So over the next five years with uh, its commission president uh, Ursula von der Leyen, von der Leyen, yeah. von der Leyen yeah. uh, you think that she is really committed yes, to, absolutely. to, to and, this. And Vice President Skinas as well. Um, and uh, he has the portfolio of uh, promoting our European way of life. And I believe that it is, it's very uh, good to, to know that, you know, promoting Jewish life is also part of promoting the European way of life. <laughs> Thank you, Katerina. Thank you very much. I don't think we have any uh, time more for questions. Uh, we're going to be moving on to the AGM. I think there's another Zoom address that you have to click on to get to that. Um, thank you for participating. We, I know we have 30 seconds left, but uh, I think we'll, we'll call it at that and give everyone a, a chance to get a cup of water and join the AGM. And um, in the future, we hope to see you again here at Betilel IJC for future podcasts, videocasts, that we will post on a new YouTube channel soon to be communicated. Thank you, Katerina, for spending, coming and uh, yeah. spending a Sunday evening with us. We Thank really appreciate much, it. Pleasure.